Well, my name is Safra Smaichi and I am a neuroscientist. I live in Sweden. I work at the Linköping University Hospital and I work on why people become wild. And that kind of fits in nicely with some of the radicalization or extremism things. So one of the things I'm interested in is uh, wild and extremism and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, uh, not really. I kind of want to separate what radicalization is and uh, the digital space obviously has a tool to kind of enhance some of those networks um, that uh, the, the radicalized people have it to. But I'm just really specifically talking about what what makes violent extremists and kind of talk about the biological side of those things and separating. And I think the definition is probably more important here and I'm going to be repeating that over and over that why and how it's important to separate the two definitions very clearly and even within the violent domains, what is violent extremism, what is other types of violence and, and you know how to contract each of them from you know depending on the ideology or the cause of the violence. And that's the only way we can go into counter terrorism per se. Um, so eventually this can lead to a better de radicalization policy using psychiatric and neuroscience. I just wanted to obviously have different perspectives on uh, extremism and what other people think, uh, but at the same time um, talk about what I do and this, the, the field that I'm into right now is it's only recently being talked about as much. The research is only about 12, 10 or 12 years old and um, by missing the whole neuroscience domain or the psychiatry domain in the terrorism aspect or in the radicalization aspect, we're kind of missing a huge chunk of evidence uh, that actually supports why people do some of the things that do. Obviously, panic school, uh, completely ignore why the brain and the behavior is like totally linked to each other. So it's very important, I think, to have perspective from you know the brain and biological side to see why some of the things happen. Like it's, it's regulated, our behaviors are regulated by our brain, and it's not just the social or the public, like economics or the politics side of it that kind of contributes to our Well, this is a root, like the internet per se, is a root to find the network. Uh, while an individual can have a need to go out and do what they do, this is the way, this is like a step and an end to what they want to do. So network is obviously hugely important, you know, when you want to predict an act of violent extremism, this is where you should be looking at. So that's absolutely important, but I wouldn't say this is the cause of it. It can enhance or like justify and validate it, but I'm not saying the cause is, is biological and that's what drives the entire thing. This is just a narrative and you can replace this narrative I mean, it's given by the internet, but any narrative, political or social or communal or ethnic or cultural, you can replace one with another. And internet is just a tool that provides the space for that narrative to thrive. And once we replace that with something else, we can't say that once the internet wasn't there, this didn't exist. Obviously it did. And it's still the physical one-on-one -on -one narrative building exercise cannot replace the internet. But it's still a more common, now you have this in your hand and you can pretty much reach whoever you want or they can reach you because there are two different types of recruitment when it comes to you know, extremist ideologies, top down and bottom up. Individual can chase the person or the group or the group can you know, spy on people who, who could be vulnerable and then approach them and kind of try and radicalize them. So this is a very important tool where this kind of exchange can happen but isn't necessarily the thing that can drive it completely. It can speed up the process in a way.